Okay. So welcome everyone to this um, book launch, very transnational book launch. I think we have people from, from um, all over the globe. Um, this is to, to, to launch um, Tom's book, Imagining Manila, Literature, Empire and Orientalism. And just to tell you a little bit about Tom from the biography that he's given me. Um, I know Tom as a, a, a colleague um, and a friend and someone who's very nice to work with at, at the University of Portsmouth. Tom is a senior lecturer in creative writing at the University of Portsmouth. Um, his previous books include The Realm of the Punisher, a political travelogue of the Philippines that was very well reviewed in the uh, London Magazine and the Times Literary Supplement. Um, he's published academic articles in A Global History of Literature and the Environment, Supernatural Cities, The Journal of Postcolonial Writing, um, social identities, um, sorry, just letting someone in, social identities and interventions. And Tom is a well-established journalist who's published articles in Private Eye, uh, The New Statesman, The Scotsman, The Telegraph, New Internationalist, Monocle, New Africa, Red Pepper, Southeast Asia Globe, and numerous print and digital media around the world. Um, for the purposes of, of the launch, I read the introduction to the book, uh, which I really enjoyed. I thought it was, it was a fabulous book. And from a very non-specialist perspective, I want to say that it's hugely um, enjoy, it's a hugely enjoyable read, written in a very accessible style. So it's kind of both academic and knowledgeable, but also highly readable, which is actually not as easy as it sounds. And a lot of academics, as we know, don't actually know how to write for readers, and Tom certainly does. Um, my sense was that Tom has the area studies scholars knowledge of the culture and history of Manila and the Philippines and the travelers curiosity for the land and the people he's clearly befriended some of you whom are here today. He has the post colonial and decolonial theorist understanding of Western constructions of what he calls Manilaism, drawing from Edward Said's concept of Orientalism and the knowledge of how Filipinos and some foreigners have answered back, subverted or deconstructed Manilaism and writing their own stories. So that was just my, my initial response to the book um, from reading the introduction. So I'd now like to introduce Roderick Galam um, to share his reflections of the book. Uh, Roderick is a senior lecturer in sociology at Oxford Brookes University. He's also worked at the Institute of Social and Cultural Anthropology, um, the Free University Berlin. His research has been funded by the Marie Curie Foundation and the German Research Foundation. And he's been a visiting scholar at Oxford University, the University of Sheffield, the University of Bath, the University of Hawaii Manoa, Hawaii Manoa, the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin, and the WZB Berlin Social Science Center. Whoa! Sorry, my dog's about to come apart. He's the author of two books, um, and he can tell you about that because my dog's about to, to start barking. And he's also published on the experience of, Philipp of Philippines in the UK, um, and he can tell you more about that. So I will now pass over to Roderick, um, who will share his reflections of Tom's book. Okay, um, thank you, Deborah, for that introduction, and I am very pleased to um, meet you here in this um, virtual event. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. Okay, thank you. Um, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, and I'd like to congratulate um, Tom for on the publication of his book, Imagining Manila. And I am delighted to be um, part of this event, um, launching it. Um, I can hear a lot of um, reverb. Um, I would like to especially greet participants from the Philippines. I know it is 3 a.m. there right now. And given how difficult the situation there, especially in Metro Manila is, um, 
that you are at all here attests to the great interest that you have in the book and perhaps to the drawing power of my esteemed uh, Manon Oscar Campomanes, <laughs> Whiting. <laughs> so when I started reading Imagining Manila, three um, things immediately came to mind. Um, the first thing that came to my mind was how different it was to read a book on the Philippines and its construction in popular literature by a British writer and academic. Most of what I have read on this subject, particularly those that adopt a post-colonial perspective, has come from US-based academics, many of whom are Filipinos or Filipino-Americans. All of these works have an activist tone and are driven by a desire to redress historical injustice. It is easy to understand why. The authors are Filipinos or Filipino-Americans whose lives have been shaped by American imperialism. I remember a conversation recounted by Reynaldo Ileto with his colleague at the National University of Singapore. This non-Filipino colleague noted that Filipino st students have an activist tone to which Eleto replied, and I quote from memory, you notice it too. It is as if these students are engaged in a fight and they are using their PhD dissertations as the ground for whatever they are struggling against. I sense this too in Tom's book, Imagining Manila is committed to rectifying injustice and shows an abundance of historical empathy for Filipinos and the necessity of representing them properly. It is relentless in exposing the biases in the perspectives of certain statements and arguments. Tom uses the agency and voice of both Filipino and non-Filipino writers to provide a counter narrative to the Manilaist science system, a counter narrative that recovers, and I quote from what he says, working class hope agency, solidarity, and community. I look at imagining Manila as involved in the generation of political affect, anger, solidarity, hope, and a sharpened vision. The second thing that came to my mind when I read Imagining Manila was how timely and appropriate it was or it is. At that time, the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis had happened only a few months before, a killing that sparked protests here and in the UK, and here in the UK and elsewhere in the world against police brutality and racial injustice. In June last year, in Bristol, a city familiar to Tom, protesters toppled a statue of the 17th century slave trader, Edward Colston from its pe um, pedestal and pushed it into the harbor. Just recently, a government report declared that there is no institutional racism in the UK. The commission that produced the report has since been accused of cherry picking the findings of research to suit its, its agenda and to support a certain narrative. That narrative of the UK being as not as a not racist um, society effectively erases the experiences of minority ethnic groups and a narrative of the past that underpins or provides the infrastructure for the lived experiences of these minority ethnic groups. This systematic denial and erasure of structural racism, of racial injustice, is of course not new. It is just the latest iteration of the very system to which the intellectual project of Imagining Manila speaks truth. You could say that one of the things Imagining Manila undertakes is, is to expose and rebut precisely this sort of knowledge production that misconstructs and misrepresents history and reality. Indeed, the book comes up with a Manilaist subspecies of Orientalism. Imagining Manila participates in the struggle over interpretive authority and shows how relational these representations of Manila and the Philippines are. We cannot really understand these representations 
without knowing and recognizing how braided they are with where they are coming from, who are making them, and the motifs that inform them. By reconciling the textualist and materialist schools of post-colonial scholarship, Tom, and I quote, closely reads the tropes and techniques of Manila's texts while positing their affiliations with the wider social, political, and economic conditions of their originating periods and tracks the evolution of these imaginative geographies. The third thing that I immediately thought of was how appropriate it would be for imagining Manila to have a Philippine edition to enable it to reach a wider audience and perhaps more of its intended audience if a more affordable edition of this book were made available to Filipino readers, especially those based in the Philippines. There is much that scholars, Filipino scholars especially, will find useful in this book. It would be interesting to see how it might be put in conversation with more recent works on Manila. For example, um, F.H. Batakan's novel, Smaller and Smaller Circles, which was published in 2002, or Edgardo Reyes's Maynila sa Kukunang Liwanag, which was published in 1975. Some time ago, Cristina Pantoja Hidalgo wrote about her observation that there was not much Philippine writing in English on the city or something to that effect. This should not be a problem for those who speak not only Filipino in English, but also other Philippine languages. A Philippine edition of Imagining Manila would also bring it close to the field, if you like, in conversation with very recent engagements with knowledge and with knowledge making and empire. And I am thinking particularly of, for example, Lisandro Claudio's Liberalism in the Post Colony and Charlie Samuel Derrick's Children of the Post Colony. I myself would find the almost 80 sterling pounds prize a bit prohibitive. And it would be a shame if the book became a rare commodity, the preserve of only those who could afford it. Though I am sure Filipinos will find a way to get around this, whether or not there is a UP shopping center. I end on the note of democratizing access to Imagining Manila. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and we can come back to some of your points um, in the Q&A. Uh, but I'd like now to pass on to Oscar, Dr. Oscar Campomanes, uh, who, is the associate who is an associate professor and holds the 2020-21 Francisco Delgado Professorial Chair in the Department of English, Loyola School of Humanities, Ateneo de Manila University. Um, his research interests include American empire critique, Filipino-American literary history, cultural studies and semiotics, art and media criticism, and critical historiography. And his recent publications include The Icelandic in the Postcolonial Critique of American Empire uh, and Ways of Hearing, Auditing Elmer, Ball again as Emong and on the threshold of digital postmodernity, uh, critical Asia archives, events, and theories. So, uh, welcome to Oscar. Thank you, uh, Deborah, for um, the introduction, and very happy to be with everyone, uh, especially <clears throat> my adding uh, Derek Galam, uh, my fellow Ilocano, Derek Galam whom I'm actually meeting for the first time and virtually too. Um, good morning from the Philippines. It's about 2.20 here in the morning. Um, first off, I, I wish to thank Nayiri Kandir. I don't know if he's around. An editor at Bloomsbury Publishing in charge of its series on politics for the honor of being asked to review a free publication copy of Tom's book for the purposes of writing an endorsement of it. And through this arrangement, as a result of which I earned instantaneously Tom's friendship, I would like to think, 
thank you to Tom himself for inviting me to join him and Derek Delam today on this virtual launch of Imagining Manila, Literature, Empire, and Orientalism. For my remarks in the short time that I have, I have decided to provide a general description and some assessment of what interested readers can expect from the book, rather than discuss certain particulars of Tom's accomplished effort in what he himself calls, quote, Orientalist discourse analysis, end quote, and the genealogical and archeological study of a long neglected species of Anglo-American Orientalism to which Tom, with this book, gives the name Manilaism, and who best, of course, to instruct us about his work, if not the author himself, when his turn to speak comes. The range that Imagining Manila covers in terms of what Tom calls literary trope and literary historical epoch is breathtaking. From Danielle Defoe's Manila sequences of 1725 to today's unqualified and denunciatory reportage on Eduardo on Duterte and a whole conspectus of popular Anglo-American writings framed between these historical moments and forms of writing. In ranging through this voluminous conspectus, and corpus of Orientalist or Manilaist texts, Tom is able to demonstrate how Manila functions as the metonym, the part that stands for the whole of the Philippines, with the complexity of this country reduced to its primate city, and with the city writ large simultaneously as and in place of what Antonio Benitez Rojo in Repeating Island has called with Indonesia, the world's meta archipelago. So Indonesia and the Philippines are considered by this eminent um, post-colonial critic and novelist, a Cuban, the meta archipelago of the world. Uh, do not be fooled by the book's subtitle literature, empire, and orientalism. This book is not just and yet another instance of Anglo-American empire critique, or worse, another offshoot of Edward Said's canonical 1978 book, Orientalism. Imagining Manila wisely does not limit itself to an anatomy of Anglo-American Orientalist images and representations of Manila and the Philippines on the model of Said's book. As a commentator on a somewhat similar project I proposed years and years ago, correctly cautioned, and by the way, it was a project that I eventually abandoned. I went in an entirely different direction. An approach like this, drawing up an anatomy of Orientalist images and representations of an other was bound to treat or is bound to treat ideology critique and discourse analysis in a vacuum of textuality, divorced from historical power relations, apart from possibly and merely regurgitating already known and rather abstract types in studies of otherness and what this commentator called their overwhelming representational imperialism. Tom's achievement in this book, in my opinion, consists in his exhaustive explorations of how ideology and representations work in interactive ways with the assertions of imperial power, particularly on the part of the United States with respect to the Philippines so as to foreground their political efficacy without reducing the work of the ideological and the representation to a paradigm of epiphenomenal causation or univocal influence. Yet another hallmark of the book, which is related to the first, is its methodological maneuver of astutely handling 
historical context in relation to a technique of textual analysis with respect to the numerous travelogues, adventure novels, and works of literary journalism that are its critical objects. Tom's study piggybacked with exquisite balancing actually, on the extensive secondary historical rela uh, literature relating to his subject, which is Anglo-American imperialism and Orientalism. And this is what impressed me, Tom, even on international relations scholarship to construct a synthetic historical and geopolitical framework necessary for probing into his primary, that is to say, textual sources and the kinds of work they performed on behalf of Anglo-American representational imperialism in specific historical moments. As Tom himself acknowledges in the prolegominal section of his book, he wanted, quote, to reconcile textualist and materialist modes of analysis uh, by closely reading the tropes and techniques of Manila's texts while positing their affinities with the wider social, political, and economic conditions of their originating periods. Thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to a vigorous discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Oscar. That, that was fascinating. Um, so I think we're now going to pass over to Tom, who's going to share some of the readings uh, from the book and, and some thoughts that he has about the process. Thank you. Um, I'm all embarrassed now because you've all been overly kind about the book um <laughs> thank you so much to um can i just interrupt yeah. very very quickly if anyone has any questions for tom while he's talking if you pop them in the chat and then we can come back to them um afterwards sorry tom that's all right no problem um yeah thank you to deborah and derek and oscar for um doing a really good job of eloquently um, summarizing the main sort of themes and arguments and sort of objectives of the book, um, you make my job a lot easier now. Um, so what I'm going to do to avoid uh, repeating anything that anyone might have said, I thought I would read a little excerpt from the introduction to the book, um, the, which is attempting two things really, and you can be the judge of whether I achieve it or not. And um, the first thing is that I sketch out um, fairly briefly, some of the main sort of research questions, some of the main sort of intentions behind the book. And the second thing is that I offer some kind of more personal um, sort of justification or, or uh, reasoning behind um, the sort of research that I did, which in court, you know, as, um, as uh, Derek and, and uh, Oscar both sort of alluded to, has not just been about um, reading lots of other people's books and, and sort of um, assessing them. It's also been a matter of sort of traveling to and from the Philippines, going into archives, going into museums, um, and you know having these sorts of these sorts of lived experiences of the Philippines. So this little bit I'm going to read to you sort of draws on on that as well. Um, if I can find it, I lived in Manila in 2009 to 10 and have been traveling back there frequently ever since. Over this time, I've grown weary of reading and hearing the countless stereotypes, half-truths, myths, and misperceptions that Westerners have about the city in particular and the Philippines in general. If I'd been given a proverbial pound, or I should say, given that this is a transnational audience, you can pound, peso, euro, dollar, whatever currency you're familiar with. Um, for every time a British person has asked me if I go to the Philippines because I'm a sex tourist, I could have retired in luxury by now. The ubiquity of child prostitution, unfortunately, is brought up almost as often. In 2015, when my then partner, a Filipina, accompanied me to view some properties for sale in my hometown of Portsmouth, the white British female estate agent asked if we had met online, perhaps realizing that she might have implied that I had paid a fee for my girlfriend via some sordid Asian bride's website. The estate agent hurriedly qualified her question with the claim that most romances begin on the internet these days anyway. <laughs> 
She then offered what I'm sure she, albeit in her cack-handed way, intended to be a compliment, but that was nonetheless grounded in problematic assumptions about the sexual willingness and availability of Asian women. They're all beautiful over there, she said to my girlfriend, and then, turning to me, added, aren't they? During a spell in a British hospital a few years earlier, I met two white middle-aged male patients who had holidayed in and around Manila. Both condemned the grinding poverty of the city while commending the zero tolerance approach to crime and the effectiveness of strong man leaders within the police, the judiciary and politics. They felt that overly liberal namby-pamby Britain could do with a dose of the same. One of the men remarked on the extraordinary optimism of Filipinos, especially in the teeth of adversity, violence and exploitation. The other man had perhaps inevitably dated a Filipina during his trip, which had stoked mixed feelings in him. These girls are naturally caring, he said, raising his eyebrows at one of the numerous Filipino migrant nurses as she rushed past our beds. Trouble is, he went on, they're all a bit simple, a bit superstitious. He then tried to corroborate his homogenizing allegation about all 50 million Filipinas with an anecdote about just one of them. His date had accused him of treading on her grave when he had stepped over her while she was sitting on the floor of their hotel room watching TV. From these and other encounters with Westerners and from popular Western books, films and TV programs, I started to form a mental image of Manila that was irreconcilable with my own lived experience of the city. As a foreigner who had formed close friendships there, made professional connections with some of its universities, NGOs and media outlets, interviewed a wide range of Manilenials for both journalistic and academic assignments, and undertaken archival research in its libraries and museums. The Manila constructed by the estate agent, the hospital patients, po-faced documentaries and sensationalist novels was a miserable landscape of crime, corruption, deprivation, sleaze, authoritarianism, and backward beliefs. Although, of course, not without its social, political, and economic problems, the Manila I knew was considerably more nuanced than that. And, um, you know, the nature of that nuance is, is a big theme of the book. It's something that I've really tried to address um, uh, and engage with. I then started to wonder exactly why my appraisal of the city so diverged from the perspectives above. Was it merely because my engagement with Manila had been more focused and sustained than other Westerners? But then how to account for the peculiar notions of those like the estate agent who had never been to Manila and were never likely to? How had their guesses and generalizations been informed by cultural, political and ideological factors? I also wondered how old were these boilerplates of people, highly sexualized women, tyrannical kingpins, simpering paupers and places, slums, crime scenes, red light districts and so forth. Given that the Philippines was a Spanish colony from the late 16th to the late 19th centuries, then was indirectly ruled by the United States and since 1946 has been economically and politically subordinate to the US and increasingly regional powers such as China, I assumed that these tropes were epiphenomena of certain preeminent global northern attitudes towards the global south. But what were the exact mechanics of that process? How have these tropes then fed back into the popular consciousness in both the West and in the Philippines? In which ways has this time and culture specific episteme accorded with and deviated from other what we might call Orientalist discourses that have tried to explicate peripheral spaces elsewhere? Given that in other contexts, oppressive discourses always necessarily spawn resistance and opposition, how successful have cultural producers in the Philippines and elsewhere been in countering, satirizing, or deconstructing these <clears throat> hegemonic paradigms? This book <clears throat> attempts to answer these sorts of questions, albeit within the confines of literary history. I focus on literature for several reasons. While over the years, films, television programs, advertisements, public relations brochures, political speeches, online content and other media have helped to manufacture external perceptions of Manila and the Philippines, there have not been enough of them over a lengthy enough period to constitute a coherent discourse as such. However, my research over the last decade has revealed that Westerners have been writing novels, travelogues, memoirs and works of literary journalism set in Manila since the early 18th century, and that common concepts, sentiments and symbolic devices can be traced through them up to the present. 
Thanks. Thank you, Tom. So now everyone knows what I mean when I say how readable Tom's writing is, because you can just listen to it and, and, and you know, you want to launch into the book. Um, does anyone have any questions uh, they would like to ask Tom at this point? Or reflection? Just in the meantime, yeah. if, if, can I just respond to something sort of practical um, kind of point really something Derek said which is about the availability and pricing of the book um I'm I've written other books for other sorts of audiences this is my first academic book and I was as shocked as anyone else who isn't a, an academic or is new to this uh by the sort of pricing the I don't know it's the opposite of a lost leader I think I don't know what you would call that but make make a small number of these books very expensive because you know that X number, a small number of libraries or whoever will buy it. Um, that is a shame, and I absolutely agree with Derek. Um, it's expensive enough for people in Britain, let alone in the Philippines. I don't know how many pesos um, ninety-four pounds equates to, but it's it's far too much. What I can say is that um, there will be a paperback edition um, coming out that will be cheaper, and I'm talking to the publisher I don't know if anyone from Bloomsbury is here at the moment today tonight if you are hello um, about sort of how the, how the book might be made accessible in in other territories including the Philippines so that's that's in process and I really I'm going to do everything I can to try and make it available as widely as possible so um. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions or points they would like to ask Tom at this point? I hate it when this happens. <laughs> Sometimes it does. Back in class. Um, <laughs> do, you wanna, yeah. maybe, do you want to tell us a little bit about the writing process, how long it took you to, you know, how much involved traveling and interviews and research, just, just a little bit about the process in terms of time scale as well. And I, then I, I could, but I'm just... Chloe. Oh yes, Edna's asked, how long did you take to write it? Um, yeah. Um, so maybe address that and then yeah, so, Louis' question. Yeah, sure. So um, it, it sort of evolved really out of a PhD that I did, um, which was a creative writing PhD. So the major element of that was um, a, a travelogue, really, a, or a piece of memoir, whatever you want to call it, which became this book I hate to uh, shamelessly self-promote but publishers are always going on at me about not I don't do that enough because I don't know I was brought up not to show off and oh, to sure, be sure. big-headed yeah but... we didn't see it Tom <laughs> so this is called the realm of the punisher um this is the you mentioned it in the um the intro um which was so so yes I so I was traveling um during that time and by this point I was working with you Deborah at, at the um at the university of portsmouth and on these trips to sort of journalistic type data for the what would become the realm of the punisher and also doing archival research and reading as many of western books about manila that i could lay my hands on by going in the university where Oscar works and also University of the Philippines and the Ayala Museum, which is another great archive. Um, and so really, uh, yeah, both, both books evolved out of the work I had to do for the PhD as people here will have done creative writing PhDs, they're relatively new um, phenomena, but you have to, in addition to submitting a sort of creative element of the PhD, you have to write a kind of uh, a critical self-reflection and so this book really developed out of that I just extended that quite by quite a lot to to, to sort of um, so I suppose all all told to kind of answer your question and as simply as I can it's really in over the last 10 years I've been writing this book um, starting with when I did the PhD when I started the PhD in about um, 2011 so yeah impressive um Louis has asked, um, I don't know if Louis, we want to pass to Louis to ask his question. Well, I don't know. I, um, it's more just that I knew a few um, 
Filipinos in the New York area when I was living there. And um, and I, I did, there was, there seemed to be a very, um, they're very eager to kind of assimilate. And well, actually it was kind of a, quite a mixed thing of assimilating, but also having very, very strong kind of community values that, you know, that grew. But I just kind of wonder from your perspective as well, being in the Philippines, how, um, the American culture, cultural influence um, sort of shaped how people thought and felt um, because of course, you know, I, don't, I find that kind of that interesting how they maybe see themselves. What well, from your perspective, what did you sort of see? Well, I mean, yeah, it's true. I mean, you, you um, it's very visible to an outsider <clears throat> um, going to the Philippines uh, um, everywhere, really. And that's there are good historical reasons that people like Oscar would be much better equipped to uh, come. The Philippines was only real kind of formal colony of the United States, I think it's fair to say, and from really 1898, 1899 through to World War II when the Japanese invaded. And after that, so there are these, these strong kind of material and historical reasons why um, the Philippines does have this kind of um, strong American cultural influence because throughout the Cold War, Philippines became a kind of satellite state um, really um, uh, in that sort of, in the, the big confrontation with the, the, the communist world or the whatever you want to call it, the Soviet and uh, Soviet Union, sort of Red China and so forth. Um, the way that that, that sort of figures in my book um, is that there's a, a chapter where I look at the construction of Manila as a sort of simulation or a kind of parody of an American city. Um, and this is, a, again, this is a sort of long-standing trope that really starts with a little bit before the American colonial period, but you can trace it all the way up to, um, let's see, sort of more contemporary travel writers like Pico Iyer, the, the uh, sort of British Indian travel writer who described the Philippine, Filipinos um, as the sort of minstrels of, which is sort of, when you think about it, quite problematic sort of racial language, isn't it? But the sort of minstrels to, to, to America, that they, they learn all American songs and play them in American style bars. And uh, um, so there is that, there has been that, that yeah, sort of trope, that long standing trope of seeing, you know, it, it's, it's ambiguous because part of that is an attempt to sort of claim ownership over the Philippines culturally and sort of discursively. Um, but it's, and and I'm sure there's a certain kind of one of the motives there is to is for sort of this sort of sense of a kind of an alliance or bringing the two cultures together, but actually when you go deeper into these sorts of representations, you find that there's also um, the Philippines is always or well, the Manila is always constructed as not it, it can never quite be the same as New York or Los Angeles or one of these Western cities, one of these American cities. There's always some telltale imperfection or flaw because again this is an orientalist idea this is you know if you start sort of um seeding these sorts of uh you know and start saying well they're kind of the same as us now then you lose that power dynamic you know you lose that you know the the the, the that sort of notion that um you know that ultimately the west the americans are kind of culturally superior to um, Manila. So it always has to be, I call it the flawed simulation or the flawed simulacrum, it always has to be constructed as being not quite right. Um, you know, and often it's quite trivial stuff to do with food. There's a, a writer um, as a sort of, um, um, trying to remember his name, I can't remember, in the late 19th century, uh, a right, a sort of American travel writer who talks about, you know, you can get apple pie in Manila, but it's not like mum makes, you know, or mom makes, right? So there's, there's a, and, and it can be quite trivial like that, or it can be on a sort of grander scale of, um, you know, uh, the, the sort of, uh, that the, the, the Manila is let down by the poverty and the crime and the corruption um, from ever being able to sort of join the first world or to be seen as equivalent to, you know, an American city or, or, or space. Questions are piling up now, so I'm going to um, 
refer you to <clears throat> Rainier Vergara. Um, I don't know if you want to ask your question personally, Rainier, or if you want me to read it. Um, I'll, I'm not sure if he's here, so I'll, I'll read it. He says, have you referred to and or read by Filipino author Nick, um, I'm going to use my Spanish accent, Nick Joaquin's work on his view on Manila? If yes, how does his view of Manila and Filipino in general fare with yours as described in the book? Yes, I have. Um, Nick Joaquin, I do. Um, I write about him in both books, actually, um, because he's obviously a major figure in Filipino literature and English. Um, he is someone who is really um, helps to contest some of these sort of Manilaist or Orientalist assumptions because he, rather than falling back on this sort of um, notion of Manila as a kind of miserable landscape that has sort of no history and no culture and so forth, which is that kind of reflex action of a lot of Western writers that I cover in the book. He actually, his book Language of the Street is an is a, is a extraordinary collection of essays that sort of celebrates the, um, well, one of the things he celebrates is the sort of cultural diversity of Manila. And he talks about how nationalist campaigns in the sort of 70s or 80s, I think when he wrote it, to rename streets after Filipinos rather than foreign heroes is, which links to what um, uh, Derek was saying about sort of putting down statues. Joaquin's view on that is, is sort of the, um, as I remember from the book, is that that's potentially problematic because it, it sort of um, ignores the fact that Manila has been this kind of multicultural palimpsest where you've had Spanish, you know, he talks about the Spanish influence, the Malay influence, the Chinese influence, the American influence, um, even the British were there in the 1760s briefly occupying, uh, not that the British had much cultural influence over it. Um, so, so yes, he, he's a very important figure in that kind of counter-strike or that counter-narrative to the sorts of Orientalist type writers that I, I look at in the book. We also have another question from um, Issa Lacuna about transnational solidarity. I don't know if you'd like to ask your question, Issa. Um, so let me see. No, that, so to read it, okay. Um, Issa says, thank you, Tom. That sounds like a very relevant book for myself and probably for many others here. Looking forward to reading it. I was wondering perhaps if you came across any possibilities of transnational solidarity proposed by your archive, given the limitations imposed by empire and Orientalism, how do different peoples from very different places foster more lasting and nuances, nuanced relationships with each other? Um, that's a good question. That's a really big question. Um, and again, I'm not sure if I'm, um, <clears throat> little old me is the, uh, 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 I'm the best person to, to sort of address that. I mean, I can, certainly in the, the texts that I um, look at in the book, there are, um, uh, some, something that comes to mind is the uh, a fairly recent uh, sort of memoir by an American called Rafe Bartholomew, an American journalist who writes about basketball and how popular and how important that is. It is the national sport of the Philippines. Obviously, it's, it, that's another product of the American period. And he is, unlike a lot of um, other sort of American writers, um, he, he's sort of, um, I think, quite progressive in the way that he suggests that, um, you know, basketball is this kind of transnational or international um, uh, sort of activity that can bring, and he, he tends to emphasize the way that that can kind of, that brings, um, you know, Filipinos and Americans together without it being a kind of coercive, oppressive, imperialistic sort of relationship, you know, so he, and, and that's really on the level of ordinary people. He spends a lot of time in the, the um, squatters areas and in schools, talking to school kids. And it's about what sort of, um, you know, again, it goes back to what, um, Derek was saying about kind of working class solidarity um, and he sees basketball as being a way that that can that 
there's a solidarity within the Philippines amongst sort of ordinary people, working people, but that that can all, that may also um, jo sort of join up to a solidarity with you know people in other countries, the US and so forth. Sorry, that sounds like a slightly um, kind of trivial answer, but that's just one sort of trope that that came to mind when you when you mentioned that. Um, I, I don't know whether I mean these are questions that maybe Derek and um, Oscar would be better. Uh, position um, to answer. I mean, in terms. Of well, actually, um, Tom, um, I was telling you before um, the launch uh, began that um, the 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 strongest for me the strongest chapter of the of the book is your penultimate one, right? Uh, where the last chapter where you evaluate uh, what you call a counter hegemonic lineage of texts produced by both Filipinos and foreigners, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That have opposed, subverted, or deconstructed many Manilist paradigms. And you mentioned a good number of them and consider their work. Um, for example, Maslin Williams, right? And then mm -hmm. Tom, Tom, Tom Bamford, or Bansford. I don't know if I wrote this down correctly, among others, including, of course, uh, Ray, right? Um, and with yourself included. But I see Isa's question as asking about the, the, the possibilities of em cultural empathy, right? Uh, as opposed to something like what the Anglo-Indian critic Sarah Soleri Goodyear calls alteritism, right? Like that, the tendency to always, right? Like, you know, some Orientalist and other racialist discourses to always subject, right? Uh, the other two otherness, right? Um, uh, mm -hmm. There was actually a related comment here about that. Let me see if I can. Um, somebody who expressed disappointment, right? Um, about the inability of people precisely to cultivate this kind of ethic, right? Uh, uh, th this uh, possibility of empathy across differences. You know? Um, and I suppose Isa is kind of, kind of thinking about that as a kind of a, like a transnational solidarity in her phrasing, right? Um, but um, um, what I personally loved about the, the critical edge of your, of your discussion through the various chapters was how you uh, always kind of ended up um, emphasizing uh, how, what you call the difficulties of representing others uh, are something mm. that these Manila, long Manila is tradition right, of writers in various genres have no problem taking on. So the difficulties of representing others which involves um, denying them, right? Their power to, their power of and their right to self-representation. That's why the last mm -hmm. chapter was for me, a, a, you know, a wonderful way to conclude the book because you look at what you call an Andes tradition of anti-Manilaism, right? Which uh, is, um, cultivated, if you like, no? not just by Filipino writers, right? But also mm -hmm. other empathetic right? foreign observers, yourself included, right? So. Well, I think it's to do, maybe to do with sort of subject positioning of these writers. I mean, you, Tom Bamforth, for example, is, a, is an aid worker. You know, he's someone who, who traveled to Manila with a very different agenda to um, these sort of more um, reactionary orientalist type writers. And so he's necessarily tuned into a kind of um, the, the sort of universal structures of, of suffering and poverty and capital and so forth. And so that might have equipped him. Well, I think it, you know, it does equip him to write more empathetically about the Philippines. So I think that's, you know, it's sort of what's the motivation for traveling somewhere, traveling from the, you know, the global north to the global south or um, is, is part of it. 
Um, and, you know, that that's true of sort of Bartholomew too. Um, right. I mean, I mentioned the anthropologist Massimo Canavacci, who talks about um, the importance of, rather than speaking for people, speaking about mm -hmm. people and listening to, to, mm -hmm. to their Same. views. Um, that also links with an observation that Benedict Anderson made about, mm -hmm. he wrote a very critical review of James Fenton's reportage, which I deal with, um, you know, another British writer of the 80s. And, and one of Anderson's criticisms, you can, there's, there's a, you can look at that critique and then you can um, maybe from that take something positive. And what, what one of Anderson's criticisms of uh, Fenton is that he doesn't, he only speaks to people in positions of power and people with very partial conceptions of, of Manila. So he talks to very wealthy expatriates. So you're going to get a you're going to get a partisan view, aren't you, of, of, of somewhere if you only speak to expats? And he's and the way Anderson puts it is that um, Fenton speaks to the boss of a plantation in Mindanao or somewhere, but not to any any of his two thousand workers. You know, so it's about sort of you know to represent a place more accurately um, and to try to engender some empathy might just be about having you know speaking to a good range a balanced range of, of sources mm -hmm. you know and of people that will give you a more nuanced picture um, I think that word nuance is very important and it's in the in the question so and that's what I tried to do with my own journalistic um, endeavors in the Philippines too you know, and Derek wants to, to say something about this yeah, as well through, thank you um, yeah, I mean, I haven't done a lot of archival research myself, and um, so I can't really, uh, I mean, on on the subject that um, Tom has, has worked on. Um, <clears throat> but um, there is a, there is an in interesting proposition made by the Filipino American scholar Julian Go in his book, um, Post-Colonial, uh, Post-colonial thought and social theory, I think, in which he try he he first he schematizes the problematic relationship between post-colonial thinking and social theory. Um, social theory being embedded in empire supports the the project of of uh, empire and post-colonial thinking. Um, uh, precisely the the uh, the the opposing spirit to that um, to to that of of social theory, um, but he tries to to reconcile the these oppositional spirits between between the between the two, and comes up with what he considers a post colonial um, social um, post colonial sociology, um, and he goes back to the to these ideas about relationality and the question asks about transnational solidarity and perhaps maybe this is an idea that we could also try to examine further and see whether it's applicable to um to i don't know maybe to humanities research and and i should note that um post-colonial theory um initially gained roots um, in, in, in humanities departments, um, literature, history, um, and it was initially snubbed by, by the social sciences. Um, uh, and, 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 and I mean, it's not that the idea of relationality is new, it's, it's present in the work of Simmel, um, et cetera. I can't mention all of them, um, um, but, uh, and and it's and there have been, of course, efforts to in social theory to precisely um, build on um, on this notion of relationality. So let, let's take, for example, dependency theory, which um, which looks at um, the the, dep the dependent relationship between. Um, a, a colonizing power and um, a, col a, a colony um, and, and um, world systems theory, which looks at cores and peripheries, right? So, I mean, but the problem with, with um, these two perspectives 
is that they depend so much on, um, on economic ideas. They, 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 they sort of privilege um, economic, uh, economic um, factors. I mean, they being, they having been influenced deeply by Marxist uh, thinking. Um, and so, um, yes, these, there are these um, perspectives that have um, laid out some uh, ideas about relations, relationalities, um, but they would not be enough. Um, so Julian Go um, develops um, um, this notion of relationality further for the purposes of developing a, a post-colonial um, social theory. Um, it doesn't so much as address um, the question as much as to lead perhaps to some paths that can be examined further. Um, uh, and and, and um, we, we know that the, the goal of post-colonial thinking and the, or decolonial thinking is precisely to, um, to um, develop a more a more just society. I mean that that sounds so cliche and but but uh, I can't be more articulate right now. <laughs> so um, I, but I but I, I I hope you get the 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 the, the, the idea. I'm sure you do, and and you can you can uh, can more clearly um, you know develop it in your in in your own words. <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, as we know, decolonial thinking is something that people who belong to colonized countries have to do and people that were colonized have to do. We just do it differently according to how we've, you know, historically been um, constructed through colonization. Um, I, I am aware of time. It's eight o'clock and we said we wanted an hour. So I'm just going to summarize um, some of the last questions. And if we can just have some short answers, if that would be okay. So um, Nadi asks, very interesting question about gender. So how many of the travelogues, memoirs, journalistic accounts that you've gone through were written by women? And if so, what, what differences have you noticed between how men and women describe the city? Um, he also asks about differences between how British and Americans describe the city. Um, but that might be a very big question. I don't know if you want to address the question about gender. I mean, because that's, those, those are really good questions and I, I could spend another hour <laughs> talking about them, but we don't have that time. So I'll just try and be brief. Um, yeah, there are a number of women writers, um, women Manilaist writers that I, I uh, look at in the book. Um, Mary Fee is someone, is a, was a part of the Thomasite um, program of American school teachers who came and helped to introduce the American sort of style of educa uh, school education into the Philippines. Um, I can, there's also, uh, I mean, she is, she and other women writers, including sort of tabloid journalists moving forward in time of the sort of 1980s and 90s that write about the Philippines as this kind of sex tourism destination and so forth. Um, what do they, I mean, unfortunately, I think they're as reactionary as the men, um, I'm sorry to say, um, sisters, um, <laughs> but um, but they their focus is different. Their focus tends to be more on the kind of domestic sphere. They will tend to talk more about, um, you know, sort of re relationships between men and women. They'll talk about Mary Fee is sort of, um, you know, is more interested in the sort of details of, um, you know, the home and food and make sort of, um, unfortunately, Unfortunately, more unflattering comparisons between the two cultures on those sorts of bases. Um, I would just point out as well that there are some in the chapter where I deal with the sort of um, uh, counter counter hegemonic writers. Some of the best novels, I think, that have challenged uh, certainly these notions of um, you know these sort of Orientalist notions are by uh, Gina Apostol and Jessica Hagedorn. Um, two brilliant novels, if you can read them. Insurrecto is the most recent one by Apostol, and Dog Eaters is a is um, a, a, a Hagedorn's book. People may know that already. And just to just try and summarise all too briefly, what these are very cleverly constructed sort of postmodern intertextual novels. 
that do a brilliant job of, of parodying and sort of deconstructing a lot of the sort of official discourses of American imperialism. There are speeches by um, uh, sort of Teddy Roosevelt that are sort of deconstructed in the Hagedorn book. Um, so th yeah, th these are these are great novels that really do a great job of of, of sort of fighting back against some of these these um, Orientalist ideas. Difference between British and American writers. Um, the main one I can think of is that the British writers in the 20th century, the British reporters like James Fenton, are, are, are generally more willing to be critical of American foreign policy and American um, uh, interference in the Philippines, I would say, especially Fenton on Marcos um, is, is very good if you can read his book, um, All the Wrong Places, I think it's called. So there's a little bit more, perhaps that's to do with the, you know, the closeness to the imperial center you know, the British being a bit, you know, not being as sort of um, close to the dominant ideology of kind of American imperialism. Um, yes, the British tend to be more critical of American influence and power. So sorry, that's a really rushed, overly brief response, but um, maybe we can pursue this another time. Uh, and then we had a question from Paolo Giuseppe Caruso, who asked about the language, um, how much Spanish influence can you still catch in the language and how many sp still speak Spanish? Uh, again, I'm probably not very well equipped. There are lots of Spanish loan words in yeah. Filipino Tagalog. Um, uh, still, I believe, um, I don't know, do we have time for one of our other guests to maybe- Yeah, that might be a question your... for Oscar perhaps. Yeah. Or... Well, yeah, well, yeah, okay, all right. So anyway, um, it's a very, um, it's a very, it's a very curious um, hierarchy of languages that you would find in the Philippines, apart, of course, from the vaunted multilinguality of the country itself. Um, Anglo-American English, right, obviously, uh, which the U.S. had no difficulty giving us a gift, that was the way they framed it, to um, um, uh, the Philippines. Um, and Filipinos uh, continues to um, 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 be the, the official language of, of state, um, of big business, of um, education, uh, or the privileged um, language uh, for those three spheres of, of Philippine life. Um, uh, but yeah, Tom was right. Um, there's a lot of, since you're asking about uh, the, the Hispanization, if you like, of Tagalog and any number of our major vernaculars or languages. The, the Spanish, unlike the Americans, were unwilling to, to, uh, to, uh, allow allow uh, the Indios, right? In the several centuries that they held sway, colonial sway uh, over Manila and the Philippines um, to, uh, you know, to, uh, to learn and develop fluency in Castilian. So at the end of the late Spanish colonial period, something like only roughly 5% of the population had functional fluency or competence in the colonizer's language. And uh, the friars and the missionaries uh, instead preferred to proselytize and Christianize in our major languages, which would explain the many loan words or linguistics transfers, right? That you would find um, in Tagalog uh, and other languages in the Philippines. That, that's fascinating. That, that's a whole other book. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so if there's no other questions, I'd just like to thank um, all of our guests for coming. And um, uh, Tom's special guest and Tom for writing the book 10 years, which when you think 10 years, actually, it doesn't seem so expensive <laughs> when you spent so long. Um, but I'm going to close it down now, I think. Um, and Deborah, sorry, can I just add, sorry. Yeah, of course. Thanks to, sorry, to 
first of all, Bloomsbury for supporting this, um, uh, and also to our to Denise Callender, our colleague in the Faculty of Creative and Cultural Industries at the University of Portsmouth for setting up the event and so forth, just that they, they need to have credit as well. And obviously thanks to everyone on the panel and thanks to everyone who came, I really appreciate it. It's, our pleasure. Uh, it's a whole new model. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank I'm going to start recording now. Okay. Um,